My name is Nina Jehozek. I'm a Wellcome Trust Integrated Veterinary Training Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. And my PhD was working in molecular neuroscience and using human cortical neurons. My clinical work, I'm back in the clinic now, I'm training in veterinary neurology and neurosurgery at the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies. I work in a referral small animal hospital and we work in the neurology and neurosurgery service. The patients that we see are uh, mostly dogs but also cats and some other exotic species with neurological problems and they suffer from very similar problems to human patients with neurological diseases. So we see a lot of epilepsy uh, and brain tumours and some surgical problems like intervertebral disc disease but importantly we also see some of those very difficult and challenging problems, the neurodegenerative disorders um, that are causing such a difficulty in human medicine right now. Cooling is the single most effective treatment for acute brain injury, which is a very attractive thing to me, but it's very limited in its clinical use because it's very practically challenging to do, particularly in adult patients, and it also carries some very worrisome risks essentially associated with that. So what my research is all about is taking a, an entire but very effective but slightly outdated neuroprotective strategy breaking it down into its molecular components and working out how we can repurpose those for a wider clinical benefit um, without cooling patients at all. There are many, many potential mechanisms by which um, cooling actually protects nerve cells. Some of those pathways are related to reducing inflammation and of course metabolic rate goes down and that can reduce a lot of oxidative stress-like damage. Um, but I'm particularly interested in the things that get switched on during cooling because um, most things get taken down a peg, whereas there are some really interesting pathways that get that, that light up. So cold shock proteins are, are one of those. And what's really interesting is that these are part of really core survival pathways within the cell. They're very highly conserved. Um, they're found all the way back in bacteria. And potentially, um, you can imagine a situation where you might want to switch those pathways on for a therapeutic benefit, so for example in neurodegenerative disorders to protect neurons. But also on the flip side of that you could see there might be instances where you actually want to turn those down. And interestingly these pathways are upregulated in some very important and difficult to treat tumours. There are two main cold shock proteins that have been established and been recognised. Um, we were the first group to actually show that they were upregulated in cooled human neurons. Um, they're called RBM3 and SERP. Um, they are both RNA binding proteins and their main function, at least we think their main function, is to bind to essential RNA transcripts and help stabilise those transcripts for translation under conditions of stress essentially. And cold, cooling or cold shock is a cellular stress. The first publication that we, we made of, of cooling in human neurons showed that we could upregulate cold shock proteins in these cells and that they were responding to cooling in the way that we would predict. So they were a useful platform um, to then investigate some cold inducible mechanisms a bit further. Um, another protein that I'm particularly interested in is tau protein. And tau is a very highly soluble microtubule associated protein. It's enriched in neuronal cells. And you may remember that this is a protein that's very um, much modified and um, hyperphosphorylated and becomes insoluble in many neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. So why is that relevant to cooling? Well, what we know from nature is that there are some very remarkable animals that go into a hibernating state, and this has been recapitulated using cooling of, of rodent models in the lab. But when that happens, the tau protein in their brains becomes very highly phosphorylated in exactly the same places that you would expect in Alzheimer's disease, and to the same extent that you would expect in Alzheimer's disease. But it's a reversible hyperphosphorylation. So when these animals come out of hibernation, all of these changes reverse. And so what I was interested in is, is there something about the way tau protein is modified when brain temperature goes down that helps to protect that brain from injury? Because hibernating and hypothermic brains are remarkably resistant to injury. I think in the immediate term, it would be really nice to show a specific role for tau protein in hypothermic neuroprotection. And we've not shown that yet. We've shown an association, which is slightly different. Beyond that, I think these cold inducible mechanisms could have quite far reaching clinical impact beyond neurodegenerative disorders and neuroregeneration, particularly in the fields of oncology and in the, and in the area of multidrug resistant infection. Um, and that's because in some of these conditions, in some tumors, um, these cold inducible pathways 
pathways are upregulated as a way for the tumour to kind of get around um, therapy. And, and the same in, in bacteria that are very re resistant to uh, antibiotics, they upregulate some of these highly conserved cold shock pathways in order to overcome um, some of these treatments. So I think if we understand these pathways better, we can tweak them in the way that we would like in order to help the patients that we see.